I had not really thought about th this dream for a very long time, but in thinking about this workshop and the things that I would, I would talk about, uh, I remembered the dream, and, and I suddenly understood that dream for the first time in terms of what I was just saying about this kind of idea of passing a test. Uh, and this is not a test that, that you're kind of graded on. It really is a test of saying whether or not someone is ready. Uh, in the dream, uh, which where this middle-aged warrior appears. The dream began where I'm in a room with, with, a, with number, a lot of people who are junior staff members. They were younger than I was. And the room was like a library, had bookshelves around it. And then this woman appeared and she kind of motioned me aside, to, took me to another part of the room or onto another room, I forget. And she asked me a question. And the question was, if my family had money, and I, and I had the power to, would I change anything in my life, in my past life? Uh, and the answer that I gave was that no, I would not change anything because everything that happened was really part of a larger path. And that even though at the time it would be impossible to know the significance of anything, uh, when, one, when one looked back, one could see that there, were th there was a kind of a, a, a method in the madness of one's life, uh, the mistakes as well as the good things that one did, and they all were contributory to a larger whole that no one could have any understanding or appreciation of at the time. Uh, and the answer which the, uh, the, uh, the middle-aged warrior in the dream acknowledged was correct. That was the right answer. Uh, looking back on that dream now, in light of the thing, things I've been saying about, about Helen, uh, and and identifying Helen as, the, as a woman in the dream for me, um, I think it became clear that, that what I was saying is that you accept people where they are and you don't try to change anything. Right? Uh, to try to change something or to try to, try to change people is, would be an example of what, what Jesus cautions us against in the Course, which is making the error real. You don't change something unless you think it's, it's wrong, and you don't think it's wrong unless you think it's real and that it has an effect on you. And then, then there's kind of that magical idea that if you, if you alter something or change somebody's behavior or change somebody's trait that you don't like, that, that you're doing something significant, right? And, and therefore you will feel better right? without really caring about, about the other person. It was like saying I was... I was I was ready now to, to be with Helen in a way that would be fully respectful of her, both her true self as well as her, her ego self. Right. And again, that was the kind of test. Um, an example of how I, f I flunked, right? Uh, one Saturday afternoon, and we usually spent Saturdays going shopping and then ending up going to Mass at a Catholic church Saturday, late Saturday afternoon. That was usually our Saturdays. Uh, but this was a, a very bad day. It was raining. It was not very nice. That's, so we spent the whole day in Helen's apartment. And uh, Helen was furious at somebody. Uh, this was one of the, uh, of the course teachers that s seemed to arise out of nowhere, uh, who was obviously building a, a little kingdom for, for himself. And Helen detested him and what he was doing. Uh, what she, she detested was the, the obvious spiritual phoniness, that this person was, was kind of really building an ego empire, had no real understanding of the Course, and sorry, had no love for it, was simply in it for what he, he can get, get out of it. And Helen ranted and raved about this person. Uh, and that was uh, juxtaposed uh, with her ranting and raving about Bill. And so that was basically the, the course of the afternoon. Uh, uh, Finally, I think it was after dinner, uh, and typically what would happen on these days, no matter what we did, is that the, the, the only time Helen would really allow herself to be quiet would be later in the evening, after dinner, and then uh, her husband Louis would take a nap, and we would sit on the couch, and if we weren't editing the course, we might have been done, done with that at this point. We would be with them talking, we would pray together, and at that point, Helen could be quiet. So I seized the opportunity, and I, I built what I, I was doing with her on an experience Helen had another vision she had in, in that summer prior to the course, when she had this experience of, uh, of, of being with Bill at an altar, and there was a, a, a huge altar that, that had the, uh, uh, the Hebrew word for God Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. And uh, from, from the back of, of the altar, Jesus appeared and Jesus started to, to come towards her. I, I'm kind of encapsulating this, the, uh, the total vision. And she started to kneel in front of Jesus and he stopped her and instead he came around. 
and he stayed in the middle and he knelt with Helen on one side and Bill on the other and the three of them knelt before this altar to God. Uh, so I took that, that, that image, which was, was a very important one for Helen, and I said, why don't we kind of, kind of pray together and why don't you see yourself with Bill on one side, this other person on the other? And let's just try to be quiet, and I'll be there with you. So that's what we did, and actually, it worked. And Helen felt better, she, the anger was gone, and when I left for the evening, I, I felt, well, that was something. Uh, I came by the next morning, and uh, usually when, uh, when Helen uh, when I answered the, the doorbell, she, she gave me a little kiss, and you know, hello, etc. And this time, she looked at me with, with a scorn and with a rage, that, uh, with, with that full measure of authority. And she said, don't you ever do that to me again. That was all she said. <laughs> and I, I don't know what she, she was talking about. Uh, she very, very rarely got angry at me, and this time she was ready to kill. Anyway, she explained to me that after I left, uh, she, she, and she went to bed a little bit after that, uh, she awoke in the middle of the night with this rage, and she was ready to kill Bill and this other person, and she was so enraged that she couldn't go back to sleep. And she tossed and turned and just fumed the rest of the night, and it was because of what I had done. Uh, now, in, once this is kind of a cute story, uh, it was not cute at the time in terms of Helen's response. But uh, I recognized then, and again, I'm not sure of the sequence of all these events, but I recognized then that I, I had no business doing that. I mean, as right-minded as it appeared to be, and as loving as it appeared to be, and certainly as coarse-centered as it appeared to be, it was not what Helen wanted. Helen wanted to be angry, and she didn't want the anger taken away, even though I obviously didn't, I didn't force it on her, but I certainly encouraged her. Um, and it was very clear to me, and something, I don't know whether that was it or something happened similar to that, which did not involve me, but at some point within the first couple of years or so of my, my relationship with her, I realized that Helen would never change. But I also realized that Helen did not have to change, and that was the significant thing. Uh, from that point on, I basically stopped trying to get her to, to, to forgive Bill or forgive Louie or forgive anybody else. So that it became clear to me once again that the most loving way one, could, one can be with Helen was simply to accept her. And that the most unloving thing one can do for Helen was to try to change her. Uh, as the Course became more well known and, and Helen met more and more people, and it was very striking when you met Helen because uh, uh, Helen had written an earlier piece actually when she was in college, kind of a, uh, uh, her life, and she, she called it Heaven and Helen. It's a wonderful title. Uh, Helen had a wonderful way with words, and that's Helen, the heaven and hell. That was Helen. Heaven, Helen, and she, was, she had both. And it was very striking to people, and I can't tell you how many people tried to change her. Right? And, and I, I would plead with them, that those people who, whom I knew, I said, don't do that. You're not helping her. And, you know, they, they, would, they would come back with the, the traditional psychological mumbo-jumbo. You know, you're, you're infantilizing her. There's a specialness, and that's course mumbo-jumbo. Uh, you know, I, you shouldn't be encouraging this. Uh, I don't think, think the word codependency was used in those years, but, but that's what they were talking about. And I, I, I would try to explain to them that they were missing the point. They were not being loving. Helen did not want to change. Well, that's silly. Nobody doesn't want to change. Besides, Helen is the lady who took down the course, and she's one who hears Jesus' voice, and she helps all these people, and she's so holy, and you know, on and on and on. And they were, it, it really, a, a lot of the attempts I really felt almost were cruel. Uh, not that they were meant cruel consciously, but you know, most of you know the line, uh, trust not your good intentions, they are not enough. All right? Good intention people are doing it for their own intentions, not for the people they're trying to help. Right? It is very important both in terms of how you approach yourself and how you approach other people, that you be accepting. That doesn't mean you don't help people on the level of form. It just means you don't try to change them unless they want to be changed. And they will let you know if they want to be changed. People are very, very good at letting you know what they want. But you have to listen because they don't always do it in words because they don't always know it consciously. But if you listen, they will tell you. Just as... Uh, I realized after a year or two of being with Helen that she did not want to change. And it was not helpful or loving or kind in any way to try to impose a change on her.